Well, it's good to be with you guys. Thank you for having me. I uh, love your pastor, Adam, both Adams. I always say the church with the Adams. And uh, other pastors and staff that I've met here and church members uh, here that I have met uh, and uh, love. And so it's just good to be with you, uh, to be with your family here today. Uh, I uh, uh, bring, a, bring a greeting from the Garden Church uh, in West Baltimore. And uh, you know, we are brothers and sisters in Christ that have not yet met. And so it's good to meet you. Good to be with you. I want to uh, just read this passage one more time just to kind of get it into, into our heads as we study it. If you haven't already turned there, it's Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, and thank you for reading that already. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. If you have it on your phone or on your lap, say amen. amen. All right. Let me read it, and we're going to dive in. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. I want to preach to you this morning on this passage under the title, Put on the New Self. Put on the New Self. Please pray with me. As we dive in, Father, we ask that you help us as we study this text, that you would help me to communicate your truths, not merely my ideas, that you would open our hearts to shape us and to fashion us according to the likeness of Christ through this text. It's for your glory and for our good that we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. I wonder if anybody can resonate with with my experience. I invited somebody after church over to my house for lunch, and uh, they said yes. And as soon as they said yes, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I remember what my house looked like when I left this morning, <laughs> and it's not good. And uh, so I ran home, and uh, and, and, and my girls, my wife, they were already there. And I said, I said hey, people are coming. I got, I got people coming over for lunch. Let's clean. And they're like, okay, when are they coming? And I said, in five minutes. And so if you can kind of imagine this scene, and we're like carrying, you know, picking up the boys' logos, leg, Legos and throwing them into a box and uh, sticking them in the closet. And we're picking up piles of the, I got two little boys, the boys' laundry all over the living room floor that they took off that morning. And we're throwing it up onto the landing, uh, you know, just hoping that nobody would peek up the stairs. Uh, my girls are taking dishes and putting them in the kitchen sink and, uh, and, and just hoping that they don't want to walk out to the kitchen, you know, and see a, a morning's worth of, like, dishes. And, uh, and then, five minutes later, after this flurry of cleaning, they show up, and we're sitting there on the couch, all chill. <laughs> Come on in. You know, welcome to our serene environment. <laughs> and then I think to myself, like, why do why do we do this? You know, why why don't why 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 do I uh, work so hard to clean up my house to please somebody that doesn't even live there, whereas we're pretty content with it? And then I think about our own Christian life. 
and I ask the same question. Why is it that we work so hard to clean up the front room of our Christian life, whereas we're content with the mess throughout the rest of the house? Just hoping that people don't ask too many questions about our lives. Hiding parts of our house, hiding rooms of our house that we don't want people to see. It's almost as if we have this front room called religion and, and that we, we know how to clean that up and look good. But just don't ask me what last night looked like, what the other parts of my life look like. We compartmentalize our lives. And this, this, this is complicated and exasperated when we believe that Christianity is merely a set of doctrines that are to be believed. When we believe that to be a Christian is merely to intellectually assent to these things, to check these boxes. Why are you a Christian? Well, because I, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this. Praise God. Christianity is a set of doctrines. That is true. But it's not merely a set of doctrines. Now, before you uh, uh, jump to the conclusion that I don't think doctrine matters, let's just remember that Ephesians chapter 1 through 3 is filled thick with doctrine. So Ephesians 1, Paul tells us that we are predestined, and he goes into this doctrine before the before creation was even formed, God loved you and chose you. In chapter 1, verse 3, he talks about the doctrine of spiritual blessings. In chapter 1, verse 7, he talks about the doctrine of redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. As we get into chapter 2, verse 1, he says that we were once dead. The doctrine of our, our, our uh, depravity before God. Verse 4 of chapter 2, but God... He doesn't leave us in our deadness. And he gets into God's activity and God's action on our part. But God made us alive in him. As chapter 2 goes on, verse 8, he explains then justification, how we're made right, by God's grace. Verse 8, he says, for by grace you have been saved, not of your own doing. And then he goes on, even a doctrine on works. He says, when, by the time you get to verse 10, he says, created to uh, as God's workmanship for what? Good works. As part of our doctrines. To do good now that we're saved. To live a life that is pleasing to God, that is good for a fellow man. As we get into chapter 3, verse 6, Paul gets into the doctrine of the mystery of salvation. How Jew and Gentile have come together as one family in the gospel. In verse 10 of chapter 3, he talks about the manifold wisdom that is made known through the church. So what we see in chapter 1 through 3 of Ephesians is doctrine, 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 and more doctrine. Some of the best theology comes out of the first three chapters of Ephesians. Yet, Paul doesn't end with chapter 3. There's three more chapters. And this is often the way Paul writes. Doctrine, what we believe, and then how does chapter 4, verse 1 start? You guys have probably covered this in previous sermons. How does chapter 4, verse 1 start? Therefore. Therefore. Chapters 1 through 3, in other words, displays the manifold wisdom of God, this multifaceted doctrinal understanding of the gospel, and then chapter 4 begins, therefore, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to do what? To walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which you've been called. So what he's saying is, is because of all of these things, because of Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, live a changed life. Walk in a manner worthy of all of these things. This great calling in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, this is what the Lord has done. Therefore, this 
is how we live. So, yes, Christianity is a set of doctrines, but it's not merely a set of doctrines. Martin Lloyd-Jones, great preacher uh, around early 20th century, he put it this way. He said, Christianity is not simply a religion of ideas and doctrines. It is not simply something we, we believe, but it is a new life. It's a new being. A new creation in Christ Jesus. Meaning, the Christian who checks all of the right boxes on the theological exam, but does not live a transformed life, is not a Christian at all. Now, I assume, because I'm preaching to people who showed up at the early service, that we want to live a changed life. For many of you, that's why you're here. It's because you want to be changed. You want to live the life of transformation in the Holy Spirit. The problem, our problem, is that we're no different in many ways than the original readers of this text. Meaning, it's too easy for us to go along with the flow and to revert to old habits and to be corrupted and to allow corruption to remain in our life through our deceitful desires. Meaning, as Paul puts it, it's too easy to walk as the Gentiles do. And if we don't solve this, we will compartmentalize our lives and we'll have a sort of a small little part of our life that's changed and the vast majority of our life will look like everybody else and remain unchanged. And worse, and that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario is that we will ruin our lives and that you will not remain and abide in Christ. So Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, for the believer, comes to us as a solution. And what it says is simple. He says this, put off your old self, in verse 22, and be renewed, how? In the spirit of your mind. We'll talk about that in verse 23. So how do people change? Like, how do we not just change the outside of the cup and clean that up so that we look good? But how do we actually get cleaned up inside and out and actually live a holistically changed life in Jesus Christ? Are you with me? How do people change? I want to give you kind of two big pictures from this text, which I I believe will inspire us to the change that we need. And it is first to remember, to look at, to see the wickedness of the wicked. And then as we see the wickedness of the wicked, to allow that to drive us to the holiness and to the beauty of Jesus Christ. Those are my two big points. So first, let's remember the wickedness of the wicked. Look at verse 17 with me. He says, now, now, now is sort of like another therefore. He's, he's saying, you know, having said all of this that I've currently said, now, here's what we're going to talk about. Here's what we're going to do. And he goes on to say, I testify in the Lord, meaning this is not just merely Paul's ideas. But Paul is going to say some big things. And uh, Pastor Adam is going to cover this uh, ne- over the next couple of weeks, I think, looking at the various commands that we see in the following verses. He says a lot. And he says these things not in the authority of Paul as just a human being who's a great teacher. But he says, I'm testifying in the Lord. This is the very word of God coming to you through the Apostle Paul. How shall we now live? This is how. He starts off with a negative. He says, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Everybody say Gentiles. Gentiles, he's not here referring to ethnicity because actually most of the Ephesian church was Gentile. 
He's using Gentile in a way that the Bible would use it, the authors would use it, in, in sort of like a nickname kind of way, a nickname for pagans, a nickname for those who are rejectors of God, a nickname for the wicked, a nickname for sort of everybody else that's not a born-again Christian. And so he's saying, don't walk as they do. Don't walk as the Gentiles do. Well, how do they live? And this is what I want to... This is where I want to put the emphasis because I think if we understand the wickedness of the wicked, we'll be driven to the holiness and the beauty of Christ. So how do the Gentiles live? Let me give you four marks of the wicked here. Number one, the futility of the mind. Verse 17. The futility of the mind. Futility, it, 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 it means empty. It means ineffective. The Gentiles have an empty and ineffective mind. Now, if you're not a Christian, one of your pushbacks, and rightly so, might be this. You might say, Joel, that doesn't make any sense. Because some non-Christians are on the forefront of innovation. Many non-Christians are on the forefront of medicine and art and science and beautiful things in the world. So how can Paul, and how can you reiterate what Paul's saying, that, that, that there's, a, there's a futility of their mind, that there's an ineffectiveness of their mind when you just look. We just, you guys have a nice view of the city, by the way. Just look around. You know, like Gentiles did a lot of this, right? And I understand that pushback, and it's a good one. And there's actually, Christianity makes sense of the world. That, there's actually a very Christian answer to that, and that is this. Every human being is made in the image of God and thus has intrinsic value and worth and beauty and dignity. Because of God's common grace to humanity, because we are in God's image, non-Christian, you are very much alive in, in many ways as it relates to loving fellow man and innovation and all of these sort of things. So what does he mean, futility of the mind? Well, what he's saying is this, and this goes back to the theology of, of spiritual deadness that he's talked about earlier. As it relates, as it relates to your ability to love God and do all things for the glory of God and do things not to make an impact merely in this world, but in eternity. See, we are like grass. We are quickly withering. The flower fades. The greatest mind will cease. The greatest innovator today will one day be looked back at as old-fashioned and will one day be forgotten. You know, in, in just three or four generations, most of our own Great-grandkids and great-great-grandkids won't even know our names. And so what Paul's saying is, is when you look at the big picture, like life is so short. And when you look at the big picture of this life compared to eternity, only what's done for Christ will last. And so therefore, all of our work and all of our, the beauty that we can kind of produce today is ultimately, not temporarily, but ultimately it's, it's wasted combined with the lack of love for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Meaning there's a futility to the mind. We're not aiming in the right direction. In the book of Revelation, those who have profited off of this world, for instance, the merchants, are weeping when they see Babylon fall. Those who have made much off of this world, those who have, they've, they've worked so hard to build Babylon, when they see the tempora temporal nature of Babylon and they see the judgment of God coming down on Babylon, they weep, not in grief or repentance, but at the fall of what they've done with their hands. So, therefore, we can profit in this world and have no profit in the next. 
the futility of the mind. Secondly, second mark of the wicked is that they are, in verse 18, darkened in their understanding. They're darkened in their understanding. I wonder if you remember what it was like to be a kid. I see a young person right over here. Maybe there's other kids. Are you afraid of the dark ever? Are you afraid of the dark ever? Are there any adults that are afraid of the dark? Some adults remain afraid of it. Okay, okay. Um, the dark can be kind of horrifying. And now, especially, go, go back to the ancient world um, when, you know, BG&E did not power our lights and you got wild animals coming into your little hut. The darkness was truly horrifying. And what, so Paul's using this, this horrifying kind of word. And he's saying they're darkened in their understanding. So he's connecting this with, with the futility of the mind. They don't see the big picture. They don't see the eternal perspective. They don't know God. They don't love God. And so therefore, they have no understanding. They're, it, they're in the dark, and that's horrifying. The third mark of the wicked is that they are alienated from the life of God. Alienated. That means to be separated or to be estranged. Look, once humans walked with God. The Bible tells us that the first humans enjoyed a, a fellowship with God. They walked regularly with Him. There was no separation between them. But once sin came into the world and death through sin, the, the, the race, the human race, plunged into alienation between man and God, separation, estranged. And so, yes, while we, again, may be alive to, very, to, to some earthly things, in the same way, we are estranged in our chief relationship. In other words, the, the non-Christian may be very alive, very close with their child, with their parent and their grandparent, with their neighbors. They may have you know, genuine affections, genuine love. But estranged from the life of God. And the life of God is the chief relationship through which we remain one with Him and with each other for all of eternity. They're alienated. Alienated, he says, from the life of God. Going on. Why? This is why I love the way Paul writes. He doesn't just say things, he explains things. And, and, and sometimes it's, it's Paul's notoriously like uh, uh, complicated to kind of outline. It's, it's, he's very logical, but he's just so deep because he, he's, he gives a statement and then he says, because, for, now, because. So he gives us another reason as to how they are alienated from God. From God. Uh, verse 18 continues, because. You see that word because right there? And this leads me to my fourth mark of the wicked. Because they have a hard and calloused heart. As he says it, because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. The ignorance, their inability to know God. He says that this is on them. This is their responsibility. In other words, it's their fault. I'm, how do, where do we say it? He says the ignorance that is on them due, here's the reason for ignorance, because they have a hard heart. Their heart has been hardened. Well, what does he mean by that? He continues on in verse 19. He says, let's explain the hard heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to every kind of impurity. Hard and calloused heart. What does that mean? Well, let's, let's talk about what a soft heart means. A soft heart is the ability to feel godly conviction. Meaning, if a Christian falls into, I'll use the word he uses here, sensuality. Sensuality is kind of this big, all-encompassing word. It means sexual immorality and much more. It's sort of all things fleshly. All things that appeal to our fleshly desires. And sexual immorality is typically right at the, the core of the definition of sensuality. So Christians can fall into sins of sensuality. 
when a Christian does, they feel conviction. When a Christian does, they feel godly remorse. When a Christian does, they, they feel this, this deep sense of like desire for godly character. God, I want to be like Christ. Meaning Christians, Christians do still sin. That is a given in Paul's writings. There is a, fle- uh, the, uh, a, a, a reality in which we're still wrapped in the flesh and tempted towards sin, and we do still sin. Yet, the Christian does not sin freely. The Christian is restrained in their sin by the Holy Spirit of God. Meaning, when we sin, it's as if the Spirit of God is blocking us, saying, no, don't do that. And we are unable to be happy and satisfied and fulfilled in our sin. I love the way that John Calvin put, described the soft heart. He says, the soft heart is is a gnawing of a guilty conscience, tormented by the dread of a divine judgment, which may be compared to the porch of hell. Christian, I wonder if you can resonate with that at all. At times when you have fallen into sin, this gnawing sense of a guilty conscience before God which drives you to the cross to see all your guilt put on Jesus Christ. And before you turn in repentance and confession to God and maybe confessing your sins to each other, there's a sense of being tormented by the dread of divine judgment. Like, oh my goodness, if I keep going down this way, I know where that's going to lead me. I cannot keep Christ and keep going down this path. You're tormented, Calvin says, by a sense of divine judgment. And he calls it as if you're sitting on the very porch of hell. You guys know that feeling? What Paul is telling us here is that the unbeliever doesn't have that. They don't have that. They have no sense of dread at the judgment of God. They have no sense of torment of, I'm in my, I'm I'm in sin, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. The, The unbeliever has no fear sitting at the porch of hell, no shame. In their actions, no sense of guilt before God. They have a, as he says it in verse 9, their heart has become calloused and they have given themselves over to these things. Sensuality. Greedy for every kind of impurity. Don't walk as the Gentiles do. There's a a great illustration in 2 Kings chapter 17 of walking as the Gentiles do. Just before Israel fell to the nation of Assyria, the last king of Israel, his name was Hosea, allowed Israel to follow the practices, I quote, follow the practices of the nations, a.k.a. walked as the Gentiles did. And what this meant for them in their day is that Hosea set up sacred stones and Asherah poles. In verse 12 of 2 Kings 17, they worshipped idols, uh, though the Lord had said, you shall not do this. In verse 15, they imitated the nations around them, although the Lord ordered them to not do as they do. Now think of this, all right? What did they do? What did Hosea do? Like, literally speaking, he took wood and he built idols similar to what the nations had. That's what he did. And you might say, well, you know, he was kind of like following God in other areas of his life. He still would claim to have loved Yahweh. He still did the sacrifices. But because of that sin of building idols... In Israel, and Asherah poles. In verse 16, it says this. It says that they, Hosea and all of Israel, they forsook 
all the commands of the Lord. All of the commands of the Lord. In verse 16, their result, or verse 15 rather, the result is it says that they became worthless. Why? Walking as the Gentiles do leads you, saints, to forsake all the commands of God. Now, let's just not stop there, all right? How do we change? Look at verse 20. He says, but, 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 That's, this is a good turn for us. This is how they live. Don't live like this. But, that is not the way that you learned Christ. Verse 20, assuming that you have heard him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self. So here's my second big heading. First big heading is, is to, to remember the wickedness of the wicked. So that, all right, for, uh, second big heading, so that you might be driven to the holiness and the beauty of Christ. How do we change? I'm going to give you three steps. Number one, put off your old self. Put off your old self. My son had, and he's 11 now, but when he was in preschool, I remember sitting in my living room as he, uh, on, on a school, school day in the morning, drinking my coffee, and Haddon comes down, and he dressed himself for school. And he's like four years old, you know, which is kind of remarkable for a four-year-old. And he dressed himself for school, and he was proud of himself. And I looked at him, and I was like, you're not wearing that. You know, he had a, a shirt with, with uh, ketchup stains on it. I mean, it looked like he took a hot dog and it just kind of rolled it down his shirt. Uh, he had pants with grass stains on it. And I was like, I was like, Haddon, that's like, those are old clothes. Like, go change. And so he was like, ugh. You know, so he walked up. We got like three floors in our house. Walked all the way up to the top. And uh, he was up there for a little while, like 10 minutes. Came back down, proud of himself because he had changed. Came back down and I look at him like, Bro, those are the same clothes that you had on 10 minutes ago. And he was like, no, they're not. He said, I took my clothes off and I threw them on the floor and I looked around and I found these clothes and I put them back on and I put them on. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm getting the picture of what happened here. Look, how many of us are trying to change? And we're trying to take off these old garments and we're throwing them on the floor and we don't know what to put on. And what do we do? We end up putting on the same old clothes. Paul is saying, take off the old self. Take off these old garments. Now, the very fact that he says to take off the old self tells us that the old self clings to us. Meaning we don't have like a one and done Christianity. Our sanctification is not once and for all. We're, we're called to put off, meaning something clings to us. There's something to put off. Are you with me? And so why then do we need to put off our old self? Verse 22. He says, put off your old self, which, or in other words, he's saying because, here's another reason. Put off your old self because it belongs to the former manner of life. And it contains these deceitful desires. Just think about those two words, deceitful desires. Not every desire we have is honest with us. But the old, how does he define the old self? I'm going to define the old self with two words, deceitful desires. That's what we have to put off. Just a couple of verses before, in chapter 4, verse 14, he describes our old self as being tossed to and fro by, by waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by cunning crafting and, and, and craftiness of people in deceitful scheming. Our old self is prone to wander. Our old self is blown by every wind, every feeling, every idea. 
Our old self is not carefully scouring the scriptures to examine our ideas and our convictions and our conscience. But rather we just go with what we feel. And our desires can be very, very deceitful. So how then do we get rid of deceitful desires? Here's how. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. So as you think about like your desires, all right? As you think about the old self, the deceitful desires. First thing I want you to do, first ex- uh, experiment is this, is to ask yourself, um, if, I, if I follow this desire, will it fulfill what it promises? Will it give me the happiness and the fulfillment that it promises? Will it give me the contentment that it, that it promises? And then as we're doing that, what we're doing is we're thinking, aren't we? We're actually thinking, and we're applying the Word of God to our mind, and, and then applying that to our desires, which then determines our behavior. So verse 23, he says, be renewed in the spirit of your minds, meaning fill your mind with good stuff. How do we change? Fill your mind with truth. How do we change? Fill your mind with pure ideas. How do we change? Fill your mind with biblical realities. This past January, I did Whole30. Has anybody ever done the Whole30? Uh, A month of torture? Whole30 is basically like this diet thing where you is zero sugar, no bread, no grains, no alcohol, no dairy, you know, no happiness. <laughs> and the first week, like the first week you're in detox, like you feel detox. You're, you're, you're like you need to be hooked up to a machine or something. It's bad. And then by like week two, week three, what happens, it's interesting, your cravings start to change. And you start craving things. This is going to sound weird. I, start, I stopped craving Snicker bars, and I started craving dates. Like, I never wanted to be that kind of person. <laughs> you know, like, hey, what do you want for dessert? I'll have a fig. Like, Serious? <laughs> And I kind of became that. Your cravings begin to change. But just because your cravings begin to change, don't think that the temptations don't remain. All right? So, Whole30 for me began in January. My, my birthday is on January 20th. That's on day 20 of Whole30. All right? I've got to eat like this on my birthday. And on my birthday, we were having a bunch of youth over to my house, and we were going to get a bunch of pizza. And my daughter, Eden, a uh, sweet 15-year-old, uh, made me an Oreo cake. And I'm like, you hate me. <laughs> she's like, I know you love Oreo cakes, and I know you can't eat it, but we'll eat it for you. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm going into this night. It's a, you know, I'm going into this night knowing that there's going to be pizza and an Oreo cake, and I can't have any of it. So you know what I did to prepare? I ate about 16 dates, about five figs, two chicken breasts, a banana, and about 10 more dates. And I stuffed myself with good stuff. Guess what? When the pizza came and the cake came out, I wasn't hungry. I was so filled with good things, I had no desire for the bad. I wonder if you guys know where I'm going with this. I wonder if anybody can resonate with this this reality. That we must be so filled with the good things of God's word that we have no craving for the junk food of the world. You see, how how do we live a healthy life? Well, physically, you live a healthy life not through starving yourself, but through eating the right food. And see, some of you in your Christian walk are trying to starve yourself 
of your, the delightful things, quote unquote, that you once enjoyed, walking as the Gentiles do, and you're trying to starve yourself of that, but you're not filling yourself with what is good and right. How do we resist sin? How do we not, how do we not keep going in that direction? We reduce the craving. How do we reduce the craving? We eat all of the healthy stuff of God's Word. We fill our minds with God's Word. Meaning, let me give you some application. Train yourself to think differently. That's what it means to renew your mind. In your free time, think about how you use your free time. Do you binge watch Netflix, scroll Facebook, Scroll Instagram, or in your free time, do you feed your, your mind with the good things of God's truth? Do you allow yourself to get a taste of heaven in your free time? In, in your free time, do you spend time reading, reading books, finding a good, ask, ask your pastors, like, give me some recommendations for some good Christian books or theology or books on doctrine and, 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 and learn to be a reader so that we can fuel our mind with what, with what is good. Or listening to good sermons. You know, somebody asked me uh, a number of weeks ago, one of my accountability partners there, he was like, how do you resist, you know, when you have like this, this temptation toward um, X, how do you resist it in that moment? And I said, what I've been doing lately is I find a Paul Washer sermon, and I listen to that. And it takes away my desire. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? Like, there's just, we can feed our minds. And and we live in an era where, where, you know, internet, it, it fuels us with bad stuff, but it can fuel us with good stuff, church. Use the resources that God's given you in your free time. Meet and spend time with God's people. Don't wait uh, to, to, for somebody to ask you to meet. Become the initiator and spend time with people. I meet with a few guys every Thursday morning for my sake. Something I initiated, not, I mean, it's for them as well, but it's also something that I need. Study your mind and your heart and search for inconsistencies in your thinking. Is it inconsistent with the Word of God? You see, we so devalue our minds in modern society We, in modern society, believe that our passions cannot be controlled, our desires haunt us, we are casualty of our surroundings, and a lot of Christianity doesn't help. A lot of Christianity says, hey, like, don't study, you know, stay away from theology, it'll kill your soul, and and stuff like that. And certainly, you know, we can become big-headed as we read and as we feed our minds with doctrinal stuff, but we don't change through adopting new behaviors, We change through adopting new ways of thinking. That's what Paul is saying here. So are you feeding your mind with good things? Jesus said this in Mark chapter 7, verse 15. He said, there's nothing outside of a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And what he meant by that is that our sin starts in the heart. Meaning conformity to the world Walking as the Gentiles do begins in our heart long before it is seen through our hands. So instead, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And as a result, verse 24, you will put on the new self. And this is my third step. Put on the new self. And by the way, this leads us straight back to grace. The very fact that you have a new self to put on is not something you did. That's something that's been given to you. The very fact that you have a new self to put on means that God has created something for you. What my son had and needed was his father, which is what I did, I took him upstairs to his room and I took off his old garments and I said, these are your new clothes. Put these on. Put on these new 
clothes. You see, this is what our Heavenly Father does for us. Stop trying to change yourself in your own strength. But look to the new clothes, the new garments, the new self that the God has already given you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you have a new self? Listen, it is something that is created for you. Look at verse 24. That's what he says. It's been created for you. And it is shaped after the likeness of God in true righteousness and in true holiness. Do you have a new self? In other words, have you ever been born again? If you've been born again, you have a new self to put on. It's something God has given you. How then are you born again? Well, you're not born again, and Pastor Adam is going to talk through this more next week. You're not born again through following these commands. You're not born again through trying to create a new self for yourself. You're born again through looking to him who loved you, who died on the cross for you, who lived the life that you should have lived, died the death that you should have died, who three days later was risen from the dead so that you might have life and new self. All who turn from their sins and trust in Jesus are forgiven now and are given a new self by the power of God's grace. And one day, One day, that self, that new self of who we are, will one day be freed from even the presence of sin, forever living with God. Turn to Christ. Trust in Jesus Christ. Because of God's mercy, Christian, the only thing that makes sense is to give our whole self to God. How do we do it? Let me, let me summarize. See the wickedness of the wicked. Remember the wickedness of the wicked. And let that drive you to the holiness of Christ. Change your mind as you receive new information. Imagine you went to Dunkin' Donuts every day, every morning, for a double chocolate donut. And you walk in Dunkin' Donuts one morning, And that double chocolate donut, there's only one left, and it's sitting right there. And you ask for the double chocolate donut. And as they pick it up, it falls on the floor. Do you still want the double chocolate donut? Well, I thought you wanted the double chocolate donut more than any other donut, right? But no longer do you want the double chocolate donut. Why? It's because you have received new information about that double chocolate donut. And you don't want a double chocolate donut. You want a Boston cream donut, which is the worst donut that any human has ever created. My point is this. As we look at the wicked, and as we are reminded of the reality of the unbeliever, that new information changes our desires, and we no longer want to walk as the Gentiles do but we want to walk in the holiness of Jesus Christ. Can I use one more food analogy before I close? I I don't know why I'm using all these food analogies. I think it started with the whole 31. When I was in college, when I was in college, I walked into our, our cafeteria once, and there was this peanut butter pie that was sitting there. And I was like, okay, this is, this is new. I took a piece of it. It was amazing. This kind of peanut butter filler with a chocolate crust. And I looked around the cafeteria and I was like, has anybody tried this pie? This is amazing. And I told everybody, go get some of this pie. This is really good stuff. And I ate the pie and I had a second piece. And then the next uh, meal I came into the cafeteria, the pie wasn't out. And I went over to the cafeteria lady and I was like, hey, you know, where, where's the pie? And so she went back to the refrigerator and brought the pie out. And that continued for the rest of the semester. I would go in and I would ask, where's the pie? And by the end of the semester, like everybody was eating the peanut butter chocolate. It became the dessert for the cafeteria, all right? Why? What compelled me to want to be on mission 
to tell everybody about how good this pie is. It's because I tasted and saw that the pie was good. Are you with me? (laughs) Has anybody tasted and seen that the Lord is good? You see, as we live the Christ-like life, as we put on the new self, what we discover is that it's better. It's really better. Why do Christians pursue holiness instead of sin? Why do Christians give up? We live a life of sobriety instead of being drunk with wine. We, we avoid sexual immorality and, and are faithful as singles or we cling to our spouse. Like, Why do we live this kind of life? It's not because we're more miserable. It's because we're more happy. It's because we have tasted and we have seen that the Lord is good. He gave his whole self to us, and so it only makes sense that we give our whole self to him. Listen, Jesus held nothing back when he lived a life on your behalf. He held nothing back as he drug the cross up the side of Calvary. He held nothing back as nails were were pounded into his feet and his hands. He held nothing back as he hung and died for your sins. He held nothing back as he got up from the grave, defeating death and defeating sin. And he holds nothing back as he ministers to you today before the Father. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. Church, God loves you. Therefore, let us love him. I wonder if anybody needs to respond with confession. I wonder if anybody needs to have a conversation with somebody afterward. Respond with repentance. Change me, oh God. Change me, oh God. And he will. Because he's taken up residence in your life. And he has given you a new self. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us, creating within us the gift of new life. We thank you for Jesus Christ. And God, I pray that as we are reminded of the wickedness of the wicked, that we would be driven to the holiness and the beauty of Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.